Welcome to Trending in Education. Mike Palmer here. Really excited today to be joined by Michael J. Foyer, who is the Dean of the Graduate School of Education and Human Development at George Washington University. He's also the author of a really fantastic book called Can Schools Save Democracy? For those of you who are viewing this, you can see it's a nice addition. Thanks for the book. I appreciate it. And there's a lot in there that I think folks can learn from. We'll be talking about that in a bit. Before we do that, I want to welcome Michael to the show. Welcome to Trending in Education. Well, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. There's a um, lot we can talk about, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. Absolutely. And we always start by getting to know our guests a little bit better. Can you share with us your origin story, the hero's quest you've been on within the world of education? Wow, wonderful. Yeah, I mean, I'm uh, originally a New York boy. I went to public school in New York. I had lots of transformative experiences during the 1960s being in the public school system of New York City. In retrospect, I'd like to be able to say that I planned my whole career trajectory based on those experiences, but of course, that would be a little bit disingenuous. Although when I think back, uh, a lot of what took place in those days uh, did have an effect on me. And eventually, I did find myself doing more and more uh, work in education. But originally, I actually, believe it or not, thought I was going to try theater. Mm. And I did that for a little while. And then I think it was when we discovered that the average annual income of actors in New York Mm. had gone up to $500, we decided maybe I should try something else. Yeah. It is interesting, the theater background. I have heard more folks talk lately about how performative teaching is as a profession. So I think there probably is a natural connection there. More likely waiting tables when you're actively acting. But if you're trying to carry it over, the teaching profession isn't a bad place to land. There is a certain kind of, both in teaching and in school leadership administration, I used to tell my colleagues that, you know, I, I looked up in my dean's orientation book that I got, the chapter on how to manage in a pandemic was yeah. ripped out of my copy. Oh so my gosh. Just having to do a certain amount of improv. Mm. A lot of yes end at the top during crazy times, I'm sure. It's, uh, yeah. And um, even without pandemics, Teaching and educational management are not exactly routinized kinds of tasks. There's, right. There's a lot that happens that you, that I think good teachers try to develop a certain kind of, shall we say, nimble yeah. flexibility. I of, think it was, it was Doug Limov who I saw teach like a champion. He was making the analogy between teaching and athletes and no. the, the number of decisions like think about like a quarterback on a football field, the number of decisions that you have to make moment to moment. Teaching is just layers and layers of decisions that you're constantly making. And and that's even, you know, independent of the content of what you're teaching. There is the whole question of whether we like the idea that schooling is still organized with classes of, you know, 20 or 25 kids and sitting more or less around either little tables or in rows. Right. There's a lot of argument about whether we should be dismantling some of that. Yeah. I have feelings about it. Regardless, the idea of having a room with a bunch of wonderful, essentially, kids who are coming into the classroom with lots of stuff yeah. and engaging and, and then picking up on some of the cues. And of course, kids have so many differences that they bring to it. So leaving aside the difficulty of something like, how do you teach, how do you divide fractions? Right. Not obvious, both in the mathematics of it and in the pedagogy of it. Right, right. So yeah, it's, there is a certain kind of theatrical side to this, I have found. But anyway, yeah, so I moved from that into more of journalism, actually. And then college, I edited school paper for a while, and I was mm -hmm. a stringer for the New York Times, and I got into really thinking. And, you know, my mother of blessed memory wanted me to be a journalist because hmm. she thought that would be a great way to see the world. Hmm. I'm not sure that the world today is what she would have wanted me to get too close to, but leaving right. that aside. Right. I mean, but also journalism is another profession and that's another space that is certainly 
fraught in our current age, but also very central to things like a public good, which is very much what comes through in your book. So we're connecting the dots here, Michael. This is pretty good. Pretty amazing. I, I, you know, usually people charge me extra to try to connect my dots, but this is wonderful. I appreciate it. So I was editing paper and writing very, you know, flowery editorials, criticizing people for everything they were doing wrong. And then it occurred to me that, you know, I was, I was writing good editorials, but I wasn't really quite understanding a lot of the issues underneath a lot of that. Mm -hmm. And that led me to want to pursue more advanced preparation and education. And one thing led to another, and it was a public policy that most attracted me. And I was very fortunate because where I studied public policy, it was an experiment in bringing into the concept of the public affairs, knowledge, skills, and analytics from different disciplines, including mm -hmm some law, moral philosophy, organization theory, mm -hmm. heavy dose of economics and mathematical statistics. Yeah. But I was very lucky to be at a place which was experimenting with that kind of what we call, here's a jargon alert, interdisciplinary preparation. And it turned out it worked well for me because I'm, as you'll see, I wander across different sorts of... Well, we're getting to interesting places because it sounds like your educational journey was perhaps ahead of the curve in terms of what we're looking for today. Because when folks are talking about the future of work and they are talking about being cross-disciplinary, being exposed to a, a wider range of perspectives and experiences is something quite a few folks are talking about. And then I do think it does connect to addressing some of the civic problems that are, are also talked about in your book, where rather than just a narrow expertise, there's a, a need to kind of widen your aperture and think about what would it be like if I approach this differently. It sounds like your experience in public affairs and your background in, in journalism in some ways puts you on a road to seeing the bigger picture, understanding how the system works. Yeah, no, it's really, it's a very interesting observation. For me, the business of interdisciplinary, I have in my mind's eye the image of, you know, wanting to build bridges across silos of yes. specific knowledge and expertise. And the, the tension here is that if you build bridges across to connect silos that themselves are not sturdy in right. their Mm -hmm. then the bridges sag and the whole thing comes yeah. down. Yeah. You need good stanchions, Michael. Yeah, that's the thing. And so there's this, I and it's interesting because I don't know to what extent the foundations in the various disciplines or areas that I touch on in the book mm -hmm. aren't actually sturdy enough. I kind of hope that they can withstand some of, of, of right. Peter's pressure on this. Right, right. A, it is an interesting thing. The other part about interdisciplinary is that it's much easier to talk about it than it is to do it. Mm -hmm. And I know this as a dean. We're always encouraging our faculty to, you know, break out of their programs, work with colleagues in other departments and other areas, yeah. because the problems that we're dealing with are way too complicated for any one discipline to actually have the lock on. Right. But talking collaboration is a lot easier than doing it. And usually I can give a great sermon about the importance of, you know, crossing the silo, connecting yeah. the silos. Right. And everybody applauds and then they go back to their silos and keep doing what they were doing. And I don't right. blame them. Right, there's right. Incentive issues. There's what's in it for me. Like what what's and in it for me. And how can I how can I take the time away from, you know, and then I'm going to be held accountable right. you know, for my budget or I'm right, going to be right. accountable by my peers in my particular right professional association. Mm -hmm. And so then you're within higher ed, you're the dean. Can you describe a little bit of the work, the nature of that role and how that connects? And then we'll get into the book. Sure. Well, it's interesting. I came to the role of dean after 17 years of working at the National Academy of Sciences. Mm -hmm. I could go off on a whole riff about the academy. And it was it's a fascinating and a very important institution in the ecology of American public policy and the political and economic and social science culture. It is essentially all about bringing evidence to bear on tough problems, mm -hmm. doing it in a way 
that is kind of special because it involves bringing people together from different disciplines with different priors, with different sort of predispositions about certain issues. Yeah. Asking them to work together and try pursue a consensus on very tough questions. So you right. can imagine what it is to have a committee with a psychologist and an economist and a, and a lawyer, and by the way, a physicist or two, and then an educator. And we put some data in front of them and say, now we're going to spend the next couple of years trying to figure out what some of this means. Yeah, Not, not a natural act for all academics. Mm -hmm. But I mention it because coming into the role of dean, I looked out over my faculty at one of my first meetings, and I said, I, I, this is interesting because I hadn't actually thought of it. But what I've got here is a group of people who are truly expert and a very high level of quality mm -hmm. in the particular areas of research. And they, you all have your points of view, which I admire greatly. And my role is going to be to see whether we can come together and reach some kind of consensus on at least some of the basic propositions. So that's been mm -hmm. sort of the way I view this. But we have programs in early childhood and higher ed in education policy, in uh, teaching and learning, and in counseling is a very big part of our school uh, these days. Yeah. So again, you have people and programs that have to be essentially well-founded, you know, sturdy in their foundations. Yeah. And then looking for ways in which how do these things connect? So one good example is, if you look at the data on something like community college attendance and attrition, community colleges play a very important role in the whole American system, or whatever you want to call it, of, of education. Mm -hmm. And there's an interesting problem that the attrition rate from community college is quite high, mm -hmm. that the number of people who start is, you know, there's a lot of fall off. Yeah. When you think about it, the population that tends to go into community college are often people who didn't have the advantage in their home backgrounds right. of a kind of constant discussion and being in the whole atmosphere about college. Right. And this is a huge opportunity for them to develop skills and, and knowledge that will advance them in life. Mm -hmm. They come into the institution uh, with a with less than the obvious kind of background that might really relate to success in an institution of higher learning. Yeah, that means that counseling, advising, and figuring out ways in which the organization can actually encourage and work with these young people is absolutely uh, essential. Mm -hmm. so we've been talking about it. We haven't actually built a program yet. Yeah. Keep telling some of my counseling people, hey, I got to get you together with some of my higher ed people. Right. You could be really doing so that's an example of where there's some interesting cross cutting, but we're doing other kind of interdisciplinary. Yeah. People. I like the, the connection though back to that bridging function you were describing, because also the community college, when it gets it right, is actually a bridge for its students too, where like the the whole yeah function there is preparing them for life afterwards. Yeah. I think that's a good pivot point into the book as okay. well, which is, you know, in some ways the book is talking about, you know, you touch on like K through 13 and thinking about beyond high school, yes. how are we equipping our students with what they need? And, you know, what is the purpose of schooling, what is the purpose of, of education? And then the question, the book title again is, can schools save democracy? I don't know, Michael, can schools yeah, save yeah, democracy? Go. Well, good. So uh, we're not going to give the whole punchline away here, but it is, it is a catchy title, which in a way reflects on what motivated me to start working on this. It's the old journalism background. Probably, yes. And also, you know, I was I was observing things going on during the pandemic when I actually found some spare time to start writing some of these ideas down. Right. And I became worried about, as many people were worried, 
about the fragility of our basic democratic institutions and what some people refer to as the guardrails of democracy. And I was observing things. And if I might, I'll just say, for me, there are essentially currently three real threats to democracy. One is what the great historian and public commentator, writer Ann Applebaum, has referred to as the lure of authoritarianism. Mm -hmm. And we are struggling with that. And I mean, without getting into the politics of naming names, but there is a quite uh, you know, well-founded anxiety that we are again in America, and I say again because if there's any glimmer of hope here, it is that we've kind of, you know, we have flirted in American yep. history with fascism, mm -hmm. but we haven't usually gotten past second base in this flirtation. Yeah. Whether we'll be able to, you know, continue to have that combination of luck and fortitude mm -hmm. is on my mind. And right, so right. This one threat is this business of the transformation of what had been a defensible ideology and political science even what what used to be known as conservatism. And I'm not actually a conservative in the conventional sense, but sure. there is now this, this threat that comes from the desire to centralize power and to use it in ways that are, you know, quite problematic. So that's right. one threat, I think, to democracy. And I'm sure our listeners and you are familiar enough with all of the rhetoric out there and the articles that are being written about this. It is, a, it is a real thing. The other related threat is that over the last, I don't know, 30, 30 plus years, maybe more, somehow we have transformed the word opponent into the word enemy. Mm -hmm. And the discourse, which used to be, I believe still is a very fundamental part of American democracy and of the American experiment. Mm -hmm. I would refer to as healthy, full-throated argumentation. Right. And partisanship. I'm not, I, I don't think partisanship is such a bad thing. I think right. the whole idea is to try to get people's parts and to have them voiced and then see what you get. But what has happened is that political difference, ideological difference, opposition has become a much more of a blood sport. Mm -hmm. And uh, it has led to, I think, an inflamed kind of from partisanship to polarization. I mean, it's a sort yeah. of ethical order there. And and it's 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 and that's very that's a challenge to our norms because it has Regardless of, you know, the technical rules of majority voting and the Electoral College, all of that is, you know, debatable, and I'm glad people are debating all that. But in terms of disposition, mm -hmm. in terms of the engagement of people and their sense of belonging to a community that can disagree and then, you know, get back to work. Right. That's another threat. Neither of those are the main point of the book, however, and that's because when I was writing the book... I was worried about the third threat, which was a kind of overzealous, almost a fundamentalism of belief in private markets, individual choice, individual rights, right. without sufficient attention to the way in which the accumulation of individual choices can lead to a social result that nobody feels good about. Right. Now, to be arguing for a kind of return to a debate about whether certain things in our society should be managed through markets or through government may seem a little bit irrelevant at this point because we're dealing with such such tremendous calamities in the world and in the right. US but this gets to the part about you know i i could say that in fact it's more an act of optimism than of irrelevance to be right. thinking because I do actually believe that we will get past the threat of autocracy, mm -hmm. that we will restore some sense of civic discourse, right? Be more familiar, mm -hmm. argumentative, strong, but but respectable, right? 
And at that point, I would like us to have young people more equipped on issues related to that tension between, let's just say, markets and government. Yeah. Like private goods versus public outcomes, individual rights, and what I call social wrongs. <laughs> and um, to have a better appreciation of that, which I think long term is very significant for the way the American democratic system is likely to work or should be working. So that's that's the, the thing about that. And, you know, yes, I mean, to, to be looking ahead to that day is the old, the other joke about optimists and pessimists, which is that the pessimist worries about World War III and the optimist worries about World War IV. And here I'm essentially saying, I hope, God willing, we will get past this autocratic impulse that we're dealing with. Right. And then I'm hoping that we have better tools in the hands of people. I look around that I was looking around during the pandemic and I was, I was very, uh, I was struck by the possibility that the, there's a whole generation of people in important leadership positions who were simply absent on the day that we were teaching simple things about public goods. Right. Now, maybe they weren't absent and maybe it wasn't being taught. Sure. And that's where a change in the curriculum might actually be something to consider. Yeah. And that's kind of where I wanted to go next, because I do find your perspective to be really beneficial to my audience in that we tend to spend a lot of time talking about technology and artificial intelligence and some of these other, you know, new hotnesses, I call it, you know, like whatever is the the flavor of the week, the flavor of the, the month. And there's a lot to talk about there. But some of the other challenges that we're facing are perhaps more fundamental and more foundational. And that's where I'd love to hear a little more of your thinking around how do we start to affect some kind of a pivot? One of the fears you share in the book is that, are we aware of this? Are we trying to correct this? Is it too late? So that's part of why I think getting the message out, making sure we reach the right people with the message is important. But can you dig in a little further into where this naturally might lead us? Well, so part of the argument here is this this does require a certain a, a certain amount of delayed gratification. I mean, what I'm arguing for here is a somewhat gradual, although I would I would start with some pilot experiments here of in, including in the way we prepare future educators mm -hmm. a little bit more of a rigorous understanding of some of these issues about individual choice and its effects on society. Mm -hmm. And I think as a direct effect, the idea is that if people preparing for careers in teaching are exposed to this in a systematic and a, and a coherent and a and a kind of um, digestible way yeah they will take it with them when they go into their classrooms and i focused on the high schools here uh, although one could argue about whether you know we that's too late already and yeah it's all of that stuff. but the idea being that they will take it with them into their classrooms right. and have some of those kinds of ideas for modules for engaging young people, mm -hmm. not necessarily in imparting a particular point of view or in imposing a certain answer to a lot of these complex questions, right. but rather to equip young people with the analytics to ask themselves, huh, I never thought of climate change as a problem of why people, you know, are inclined to just purchase an automobile right. that doesn't have the expensive, you know, electronic gadgets right. to prevent emission control, em emissions, et cetera. And to yeah. give young people a, an appreciation for that. How they come down in the end on something like uh, what we should be doing about climate change, I'd love to see an engagement in classrooms there where young people who are incredibly smart and inventive in their own right mm -hmm. uh, might actually come up with some some new ideas about this now that doesn't mean that i am absolving the profession or right. teachers from part of what i think is their responsibility 
which is to establish some moral ground rules for all of this. Right. And so by saying, I want them to prepare people to have the skills to reach their own judgments, I do think we have an obligation to introduce factual, empirical knowledge in the course of developing this kind of dialogue with, with young people. Yeah. But there's there's other examples of where I think to present to people the the problem of take something like, you know, whether it's artificial intelligence or digital media and social media. Right. I mean, you have an a, and I would love to engage with young people on this question. Mm -hmm. Social media and the internet is clearly a step in the direction of the democratization of information. Mm -hmm. You suddenly have a technology which enables people to have their voice heard much more easily than I've got a drawer, I've got a stack full of letters to the editor, yep. which have been politely declined. And now I can say, you know what, the hell with the New York yeah. Times. I'm going to just put this on my on my website. You'll save on postage. There's all sorts of benefits. Postage, save on paper, all the rest. The downside, of course, and you know where this is going, mm -hmm. is that we have this very kind of wild west of information where some of the curatorial function yeah. is lost. Right. And now you have a social problem resulting from the accumulation of what are rational individual choices. Right. My idea to be out there. I'm going to put it out there. But now you have a social situation where people are seeing and hearing all kinds of stuff where it's very hard to evaluate whether there's any, you know, anything factual, anything real. And that's why we're in this hot debate about, you know, whether any of the big apps and the social media sites right. need to do something about conspiracy theories and mm -hmm. hate traffic and yeah. all the, those are the extremes. But even just in terms of how does one manage the barrage of information. So yeah, yeah. I don't have an answer to that, obviously. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I did I, you know, I, I'd probably be rich. But I do think it's it's the kind of question where attention to this basic model of the surprising effect of smart, good people acting in their own self-interest, mm -hmm. the result that that can have on society is at least something I would like more people to remember and appreciate. Yeah. Footnote, in public policy school and in some good economics departments today and in some good political science departments today, this is a staple of the program. Yeah, it's tragedy of the commons, come on. Tragedy of the commons, right. Now, it's yeah. interesting to me, if you were to go into uh, Capitol Hill and, uh, you know, I just don't know the answer to this, but I worry... Mm -hmm don't have enough in our elected elites who even have a sense of what we're talking about. On right. Yeah, because to your point, you know, the tragedy of the commons is, is basically what you're describing. It's the old analogy metaphor of the, the central commons that everyone in the town could use for their own benefit, do some farming, do some tilling. But if they're all doing that in their own self-interest, ultimately, the commons decays, declines to the detriment of society. The flip side is if there is some sense of society protecting that common good. It allows the the town, the culture to flourish. I think your point is spot on where I don't think I was exposed to that until college. Mm -hmm. And even then it was because I, I think I, I did it in a philosophy class. To me, it speaks to the relevance problem, which you also talk about. I got the three R's from you. Relevance, relevance, relevance. I, I'm going to steal that religiously. So thank you for that. But it does seem like the job of leaders, educators, et cetera, now is how do we connect things like the climate crisis, polarization, you know, unchecked social media, artificial intelligence? How do we connect that to whatever the curricular responsibilities we might have in our class? You know, if we're teaching math or we're teaching physics, how does that connect to these big problems? And then how do we model for students more of a how than a what, more of a process than a product? You know, you hit on all the, I learned it from you, Michael. A lot of this is in your book. Well, look, first of all, this business of process and product, that was fun for me to kind of 
toy around with. I mean, the idea is that there has always been in American education, and this may be different from the way other societies have understood the purposes of schooling. Mm -hmm. There has always been in American education a sense that just participating in it is itself a way to orient young people. And I borrow that phrase from a, a colleague actually at Stanford, and I, I cite him in the book. But the idea that we are orienting young people toward what it means to participate in a democracy mm -hmm. without exactly specifying what that really means, mm -hmm. that's where the process of engagement in classrooms, in schools, on tough issues is in itself, I think, something that we used to and probably in many places still today value. Mm -hmm. Although here again, footnote, there are some places where parents and others in the community get very nervous about the idea that we're going to let the kids figure out what they think about any of these issues. Right. And and let's let's have a look at those books that they're planning to tell our kids to read. Yeah. So none of this is a cakewalk, especially nowadays. Right. Process thing is that's right. So I would imagine, you know, for example, a classroom where the topic might be something like 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 climate change. I mean, this is on the minds of a lot of young people for good reason. And I hope they they fix it so that you know their kids and the, the rest of us. Uh, have a planet still yeah something. yeah but in thinking about that i could imagine having a visitor from the environmental protection agency and a visitor from the automobile club of america yeah and a teacher in the classroom who has the idea that understanding climate change requires knowledge of the chemistry yeah hell happens to you know fumes that they, they 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 mess up the ozone okay i want i want young people to have a little more appreciation for that mm -hmm. and for them to get a sense of now wait a second you mean there's a there's an economic rationale here for some kind of intervention yeah. some kind of social god forbid control yeah right and again without wanting to be the one to find the point on the thermostat between individual choice and social control of any sort, right. I would like at least more people to appreciate why that's even an interesting question. So as right. a process thing, and the product is that when these kids, you know, they grow up a little and they go to their next cocktail party and somebody's mouthing off about how climate change is really just an easy thing to fix. All you need is boom, boom, boom. Right like these students be able to say, yeah, but you know, have you thought about the fact that for any particular country even, mm -hmm. there is a sense of not wanting to be taken for a sucker and picking up the cost of something that actually is benefits the larger society or the world. I mean, these are, these are complicated things. So that's part of the process and product thing. But there's other good examples, you know, people who are interested in, again, I and mean, we have in our high schools and certainly in big high schools, we have kids who are contemplating careers in business. And I want them to feel good about that. Yeah. And then I would like to ask them the following question. Have you ever thought about how it is that the best radio program about the market and the world of business is on a public radio station? Mm. When Kai Rizdahl does the numbers. It's American public radio. Yeah. The name of his show is Marketplace. Mm -hmm. It's coming from a non-market place. Right, right, right. I would love young people to get an appreciation for, oh, in other words, there is something about the provision of this information mm -hmm. that influences or affects its credibility and its value. If Kai Rizdahl's numbers were sponsored by Citibank or by Amazon or by, I don't know, ExxonMobil, right. the numbers might still be right, but the credibility might not be quite as strong. Right. And so you have this 
I think, an interesting kind of anomaly. One of the best places to get information about the market is a non-market. It does speak to the importance of information literacy, media literacy, things that aren't necessarily as formally embedded in the curriculum. We have to figure out how to get that to the students. And then the other audience that you're very much focused on is then how do we reach our teachers first? And teaching as a profession is going through some serious existential throws these days. There are challenges that the profession that our teachers are feeling at an individual level, we have to be able to reach them and then give them the supports and the time that they need yeah. so that they're the tooling that they need so that they're able to really make as much of an impact. You know, can schools save democracy in some ways? You know, can our teachers help us save democracy? My up and down on this is that I do believe that schools have to be part of this, number one. Yeah. I don't believe they can go it alone. I think we have a tendency uh, in the U.S., but elsewhere also, that when we're in a period of either social unrest or social uncertainty or anxiety about, you know, name it, international competitiveness, the declining middle class, mm -hmm. climate change, it doesn't take long for people to say, yeah, if only those knuckleheads in the public school system had done a better job, we wouldn't have this mess. Yeah. I'm not in that zone. At the same time, I think that schools must be part of the strategy of trying to address these things. Yeah. And that in so doing, we would be exploiting a real advantage because of how much education is valued and cherished in American society and in other countries as well or more. Mm -hmm. And that therefore, we have an opportunity here through this thing. On the other hand, in other words, through engaging with schools and school people. Yeah. On the other hand, as you said quite rightly, the teaching profession is going through, again, some terrible turmoil. And, you know, it, if there's one thing that your basic all-purpose, average, hardworking, well-meaning high school teacher does not need right now, it's somebody else knocking on the door and saying, step aside, I've got the solution to your problems, yeah. and I'll know how to do this. Mm -hmm. And we have made that mistake in essentially a system which is drop from the sky innovations for teachers without any real appreciation of what that does in terms of their professional status. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the more prominent thinkers about education policy who passed away just a few years ago, Richard Elmore was his name. He was a professor at Harvard. He was a friend and colleague. And he used to say, you know, one of the problems with American education is not that it's stuck in its old ways. It's that it, it is awash in innovation. Mm -hmm. And I am sensitive to not wanting to give teachers yet another fire yeah. hose of mm -hmm. stuff. Mm -hmm. So I believe that one way, and again, this is where it requires a certain amount of delayed gratification, because rather than hitting the teachers directly right at the get-go with this sort of idea of political economy, collective action, social choice, and those things, those yeah. tools, have it go through the educator preparation system Yep. so that they get this and it becomes part of what is a very complex set of skills and knowledge that they need to be good teachers. That's the other part of this argument that you know, why start with teacher preparation? Because I think we have a better chance of engaging with the future teaching force yeah. that way than trying to knock on the, the doors of 1.6 million high school teachers and saying, I, I, I've got something I'd like you to try. Exactly. It's just not realistic. And by the way, I think if I can just go one inch further on that, one of the potential positive side benefits, side effects, of doing this in institutions of higher education in their teacher ed programs is that it could promote and encourage some new connections between experts in pedagogy who are preparing future teachers, yeah. people who have expertise in some of these issues of economics, moral philosophy, mm -hmm. social choice literature, mm -hmm. 
tried this out gently with some of my dean colleagues, even at GW. What do you think about if we put together just like one class session where we'd have a, a discussion about, take something like climate, mm -hmm. and have somebody from the economics department, somebody from the chemistry department, and one of my teacher educators, and think together about how that might actually engage future educators. Mm -hmm. My assumption is, and I have a little experience with these sorts of things, that for students in that kind of an in, in classroom setting, hearing those different perspectives and watching the chemist and the economist and the educator argue about who's on first and what's on second yeah. will itself promote some new, you know, it'll maybe light up some new uh, neurons up there and we'll see what comes of it. Absolutely. And then hopefully the students are given a little more agency to engage, which is another thing the, the rising generations are certainly looking for. We could talk at length with Michael J. Foyer, who is the author of Can Schools Save Democracy? It sounds like probably, but it's going to take some help. It's going to take some optimism. Pick up the book, read about it, learn more about what Michael has going on. It sounds like, you know, there's a bit of a call to service, I guess, that's also implicit and maybe a little bit explicit in here too, where, you know, tyrants win when the populace lets them to some extent. So like we are all being called to action by the civic crisis we're in. That tees you up for your closing thoughts here, Michael. Thanks so much for joining us on today's episode. Well, it's wonderful. It's been great to have inspiration to get me to rethink even some of the stuff that's in the book. Yeah. The short answer to the question is schools have to be part of our determination to save democracy. I think it was Churchill who probably once said it's horrible, com except compared to all the other systems. Yeah. And yeah. I, I'm basically an old fashioned believer in liberal with a small L, mm -hmm. liberal, moral, regulated, democratic capitalism. Mm -hmm. And I hope that we can together uh, find ways to uh, reset some of our clocks, uh, get past the current anxieties and awful things going on in our world and in the world more generally, and return to thinking about, gosh, what are the best ways to arrange certain kinds of things in our complicated economy and society. Mm -hmm. For that, I'm kind of hoping that attention to some of these models, the tragedy, the commons, the prisoner's dilemma, yeah. that none of these have instant formulaic solutions at the end of them. Right. They should be invitations to people to say, okay, different ways of organizing things all have their advantages and disadvantages. What do we make of all that? Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm kind of hoping to promote some more discussion about it. And I thank you really for your great questions and for being as interested as you are in this. And thank you. It's awesome. Great. Fantastic stuff here. The book again is Can Schools Save Democracy, Civic Education, and the Common Good? It's available anywhere you get books. Michael J. Foyer, thank you so much for joining me on today's episode. Thank you. A great pleasure. All the okay. best. And for our listeners, hopefully you enjoyed what you heard. If you did, please subscribe, tell your friends. We're also on YouTube. If you want to check us out, we'll be back again soon. Thank you for listening.